Um, so our next speaker today will be uh, Joaquin Drut. He's gonna talk about uh, towards higher virial coefficients with automated algebra. So Joaquin, uh, again, so 20 minutes and I'll remind you that you have five to wrap up. Thank you. That's good. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. It's great to be here. And like everybody else, I look forward to actually uh, meeting with all of you, uh, hopefully sooner rather than later in Trento. Um, I appreciate that the organizers have uh, uh, kept uh, on the, the uh, energy to, to uh, at least have this, uh, this virtual meeting, which uh, I, I found very interesting. And I'll refer, in fact, to some of the, some of the previous talks uh, during, my, during my talk. So um, I want to start with a quick advertisement. Um, the the uh, recent progress in many body theory conference uh, number twenty one uh, was supposed to be uh, uh, this year. Uh, it was going to be in September, but of course we had to cancel that and we pushed it to twenty twenty two. Hopefully that will take place. So uh, I hope that we'll see. Uh, I will see many of you there. This is a conference organized in collaboration with uh, Duke, NC State, and Oak Ridge, um, but it's it's uh, it's going to happen here in Chapel Hill. So with that out of the way, uh, this will be the claim of my talk. I'm going to jump right in. Uh, my claim is that there is huge untapped potential in algebra automation for quantum antibody theory, in particular at finite temperature. And I've seen a few groups uh, in the US and in Europe, uh, at least, uh, looking at uh, algebra automation for uh, perturbation theory and, and other applications. And, and uh, that here I will show you one of our applications at finite temperature involving the virial expansion, of course. And I will show you results that um, just a few years ago, I really didn't think that it were possible to obtain. And uh, I hope that it will convince you of that. And the context is, is a lot like what you've seen in previous talks, like uh, the talk by Joe Carlson, for example, or, or the talk by uh, Mark uh, Alford, where uh, it's somewhere in between nuclear astrophysics and ultrafold atoms. And in particular on the nuclear astrophysics side, uh, if you're interested in describing uh, neutron stars, neutron star mergers, uh, or core collapse supernovae, then, then your simulations will need as an input uh, a certain amount of nuclear physics, uh, like the pressure density equation of state, which we heard about today. Quasi particle spectrum is important uh, to understand cooling. And uh, again, like we, we heard from, from Mark uh, yesterday, uh, density and spin response are important. Hydrodynamic response like viscosity and uh, thermal conductivity are important. And uh, in particular, all this, of course, at finite temperature. And if you want to understand this uh, matter inside neutron star, then you're interested in understanding what happens in a wide range of densities going from um, several times nuclear saturation density as shown here. Um, uh, so, so when you have, when you have uh, quarks flying around to all the way, uh, when you have overlapping uh, nucleons uh, all the way to uh, low densities. So going from high densities to low densities here to, to, uh, to nucleons. And, and for this talk, I will uh, be considering uh, uh, an even lower density, uh, a regime that is relevant for not just for nuclear astrophysics in, in the dilute matter, uh, dilute neutral matter regime, but also for dilute atoms. And that's a well-known regime of um, the unitary point. It's a universal regime in the sense that you have a large scattering length for dilute neutral matter and short effective range. Uh, and the same for, for atoms you have. Uh, uh, if you have, for example, lithium or potassium atoms, you you can tune them to have a very large scattering length, and they'll have a short effective range. Uh, the idealized regime that captures that is, is, like I said, the unitary limit of infinite scattering length and zero range. This is well known. I don't think this uh, needs a lot of an introduction for most people here. Uh, it's a very challenging regime, uh, but it's been studied heavily. In fact, there's a book. Uh, so I'd like to uh, uh, put this up here, even though I'm not one of the authors, I'm not even a contributor. In this book, but uh, but I think it's important to note that that uh, there's there's this out there, so a lot is known, but there's still a number of open questions, uh, and uh, and some some of these questions were addressed, in fact, by by Joe Carlson yesterday, and and the the Hamiltonian that captures this unitary limit again is known to a lot of people here. It's just uh, if you think about uh, having neutrons or dilute atoms, it's just a system of spin one half fermions, so two species of fermions with a contact two by fours. So if your system is dilute enough, then this is what captures the physics. And, um, and, and, and this uh, being a, a zero range interaction, you need to somehow renormalize it. And you, you do so by solving the two body problem. And that's how you relate then the, your bare coupling that appears here as a G to uh, the scattering properties, like uh, the, the um, scattering length and the effective range. So, so you, you connect then the, 
the, the spectrum, the energy spectrum to the uh, coupling constant in that way. And if you tune then the coupling constant to unitarity, what you, what you expect to have is infinite scattering length, zero range. And in fact, that goes exactly to zero at unitarity. That's, that's uh, what you want to achieve when you tune this uh, the system to unitarity, that the two-body problem has these properties that pico tangent delta is zero, um, where delta supports the phase shift. And this gives you, uh, uh, if you, if you, in fact, if you dial the interaction, not just at unitarity, but if you dial the interaction, you, you have this uh, well-known uh, BCSBC crossover um, phase diagram, where um, uh, here you have the, the weakly interacting system all the way to the far left on the horizontal axis. And so weak coupling, you have VCS type superfluid at low enough temperatures. You increase the coupling, you go across your entirety, you get a VC type superfluid. So you have effectively uh, dimers, so bosons, and um, when the bosons are condensed at low enough temperatures and the high enough temperatures, you get a normal non-superfluid uh, regime and uh, you, you, you will have around unitarity something that is a non-fermi liquid, non-ordered phase. And, and the focus of this talk is going to be around this region. And uh, I want to mention before going into that though, that, that there's of course something that again was also mentioned, uh, I believe um, uh, in a, uh, by, by Mark yesterday that uh, you, you could have, uh, uh, yeah, you would expect to have some kind of exotic superfluid as you increase the polarization. So if you, as you vary the number of um, spin up and spin down particles relative to one another, and, and, and that's not gonna be the focus of this talk, but this, this is an interesting regime that, um, that could be studied with the tools that, that I will talk about today. Uh, so like I said, though, I will focus on this uh, uh, regime here. And I promise you, this is the only animation I have in this talk. Uh, and uh, the, 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 what I want to describe is the quantum classical crossover. So this region, I find a temperature above the critical temperature uh, where, where I expect to have a non-fermi liquid, non-ordered um, type of system that eventually at high enough temperature becomes the classical gas, but where you see quantum effects and possibly also you expect to see pairing effects here before a condensation. And I will be focusing on the unitary limit, but I will also show results away from unitarity uh, towards weaker coupling. So the technical details involved in, in this are, are then as follows. Uh, the, the, the challenge is that we have this Hamiltonian and we want to calculate the thermodynamics in an ab initio non-perturbative way. Uh, and and, and we, we expect this to be challenging as we go towards unitarity and beyond. And uh, to characterize that particular regime that I, I just mentioned, we will use the real expansion that's, that would be the whole point. The, the uh, thermodynamics is of course captured by the grand canonical partition function that can be expanded in powers of the fugacity, uh, e to the beta mu, where mu is of course coming up potential, beta is the inverse temperature. And these coefficients qn are the, grand, are the canonical partition functions. So the traces over the n particle uh, subspaces of the Hilbert space. Um, more specifically, I'll be interested in capturing the interaction effects. And those are encoded in this change in the grand uh, canonical potential, which is just the log of the ratio of the interacting to non-interacting partition functions. And that is really what you expand uh, in the real expansion uh, in the sense that you would have some, uh, you have one body uh, partition function here, but then these are your coefficients that will be, uh, that will, will, uh, will not scale with the size of the system. There, there will be just some numbers. These are the real coefficients. Then, uh, and, and, and these are connected to the QNs, as I will show in the next slide. If you insert this um, partition function into this expression, then you obtain uh, the connection between delta Bn's and the QN. And delta Bn is, of course, the, just the difference between interacting and non-interacting uh, and particle coefficients. These are obtained typically by solving the embodied problem. That's, that's sort of the, uh, um, the, the straightforward but difficult way to do it. You solve the embodied problem, you calculate the partition functions um, by using the spectrum of the system, and then you insert them in the expansion, you obtain delta Bn's. And, uh, and once you obtain those, then you have access to the thermodynamics and in fact, even the static response uh, of the system. If you, and you obtain this, this, uh, this uh, delta Bn's, these uh, changes in the real coefficients as a function of the coupling, then you also have access to the real expansion for trans contact, which was mentioned also yesterday uh, during, um, uh, I believe during uh, Joe Carlson's talk. Uh, I mentioned that I, I wanted to, to um, show these expressions where you see how the real coefficients are related to the change in the partition functions for two body, three body, four body, and so on. This list of course goes to infinity. 
and uh, and this is where you will see uh, in, in a couple of slides you'll see the the challenge in doing this uh, now I, I of course for the for the two particle case this this you have to solve the two body problem that's of course solvable and that's why we know from the Beth Olympic formula from 1937 we know this exactly we know the relationship between that second order vehicle coefficient and the scattering properties of the system now for delta v3s that's much more challenging and, and um, you only see precise calculations of delta v3 uh, only in the 21st century and in very specific cases and then going beyond that to delta v4 then only in the last decade uh, and again only in very specific cases and, and and the reason is that again this is very challenging and you would do it by trying to solve the three and four body problems and, uh, and, and and form the partition function to try to resolve the differences that you need to resolve in order to construct these quantities. And this is the, the key point that, that to access, uh, rather accessing QN gives you access to the vehicle coefficients, but each QN scales like the volume to the power N. So in other words, you sort of can sort of see it here, how that works out because you, know, you take, for example, Delta V4, this is volume independent, is an intensive quantity, uh, but you see that there's a Q1 here that scales like the volume, this scales like the volume squared. So somehow these two terms are canceling whatever's going on in here. And you need to resolve all those cancellations. And that's why uh, this is difficult to do. It's difficult to do with Monte Carlo. And uh, I should mention here uh, for the first time, uh, I should mention the, the work of uh, Dörte and, and, and her student. Um, I will mention Jan and Blume here in, uh, uh, multiple times uh, that they, they actually accomplished a calculation of Delta before with Monte Carlo. And that was, um, the, I think that that was uh, hard work. I think that that, that took uh, a substantial effort. And that part of the reason is that one needs to resolve these um, these cancellations. So what I propose then to do here, and I will show results of that, is to proceed analytically, but still aided by computers. So all the integrals that need to be done will be done analytically, and then we assemble the results with the uh, um, um, arbitrary precision, and we do all that with computers. And the gist of the method is to um, uh, split the temporal um, uh, direction in, into a lattice. That's how we all would do it if we do a lattice calculation. Uh, you, you do a trotter Zucchi factorization. And, uh, uh, and, and instead of taking this limit right away, we fix this, uh, this parameter k here. And uh, we, uh, we go ahead and calculate that fixed k. So of course, what I've done here is I've split the Hamiltonian into kinetic and potential energies. And this is how you would do normally trotter Suzuki. But now you fix k, you fix this parameter k, and you go ahead and take this, this trace of this approximation, a trace over n particle. Uh, subspace, which is what you need to form QN. And uh, uh, this then uh, results in a sequence of integrals, uh, and, uh, and that can be automated. All those integrals can be done exactly in the case of interest here, because uh, this is a, a Gaussian factor, and this uh, is momentum independent. And I, I will show you what I mean by that in the next slide. But once you have that, you automate to obtain uh, delta Bn uh, from your QNs, and you can do that with arbitrary precision. And then from there, you can extrapolate to large K after that. So you do that for a number of values of k. And this is the strategy, or at least the gist of it. And it started back in 2018. Uh, we had the sort of the first nugget of the idea with my student Chris Schill uh, a few years uh, back. So like I said, in 2018. And then it sort of culminated uh, last year, although we just put another uh, paper out uh, on, on, on this, with uh, the work with my student Yachi Ho, who um, uh, helped, uh, well, really led the work that I will show you. Uh, in the coming slides uh, and was published in PRL. It, it, it made it to editor suggestions. So we were very happy about that. But I want to say a few words uh, uh, about what's involved in this automation before going forward uh, to the results. And that is that uh, when, I, when I show you this, this uh, arrow here, uh, what's, what's involved in this and, and what helps you is that we have a contact interaction. And so if you have a contact interaction, then that means that you have this constant in momentum space. Uh, so the contact interaction is just, just uh, it preserves, of course, uh, it conserves total momentum, but otherwise it's a constant in momentum space. And so that means that, that uh, the result of trying to take this trace is just a bunch of Gaussians. You really, you just only have Gaussian integrals in momentum space uh, because you have this Gaussian factor and then these delta functions, this uh, Kronecker delta is just, just um, uh, connect the various indices in, in some way. And you, you, all you have is quadratic forms in the exponent and you can do all those Gaussians analytically. So, so those are known. You get, a, you get some determinants and, and you do those and then you combine those determinants at the end. Now, if the calculation uh, requires a more complicated interaction, then you could in principle consider writing uh, this matrix elements 
expanded in a Gaussian basis. And so again, all you have is a bunch of Gaussians and this could in principle be done also for more complicated interactions. But for this talk, I will only look at a contact interaction and uh, we're gonna go from weak coupling all the way to unitarity. So without further ado, then let me show you our first results. Uh, uh, the, the, well, this were not our first, very, very first results, but these are some of our most interesting first results. Uh, we, we try to go to calculate delta before at unitarity. And, and this is one of the first plots that we put together showing results from a couple of experiments, uh, the work by, by Jan Blume with, uh, done with path integral Monte Carlo um, and, uh, and then some uh, diagrammatic and, uh, and a conjecture. So Nam Bretcon and colleagues, uh, this is a group from Australia and uh, and Endon Castan uh, conjectured um, that, that result. And, and our results are shown here with this error band. And so we're very happy to, to see this. We talked to the experimentalists and they told us well, uh, yeah, this uh, is very hard to obtain this number from, um, from, from uh, the experiment, from the equation of state, because uh, you need to assume that delta B5 is small. And, uh, and you will see that actually it's, it's not small, uh, it turns out. And so, so I think now that there's, um, we, we, uh, our opinion is that, there, that this is settled. Uh, and so that the result is, is uh, really in agreement with Endon Castan here, that this is uh, at the bottom of this error bar, this is the, this is the answer. Uh, and, and to carry out this calculation, at least the one shown here, we went up to a maximum K in the total Suzuki of 12, and then we used that to extrapolate. Uh, and so this, uh, this was our first, uh, if you want, the uh, most interesting result. But uh, we, we didn't stop really here. We, we actually mapped the whole uh, coupling um, space, if you want, from, from uh, the non-interacting point all the way to the unitary limit. And shown here are multiple results. So you have delta V3, and this is the rea in reality the first thing that we computed, calculated delta B3 to make sure that we uh, didn't do any damage, that we agreed with what was known. Uh, in fact, delta B3 is known with very good accuracy at unitarity and, and away from unitarity was calculated analytically by Xavier Leidonis. And so we, we went ahead and, and calculated that and, and uh, our results are in blue here and we're very happy with that. And so we're confident then uh, on delta B4 and we went forward with that and went to delta B5, which would flip the sign here so it doesn't interfere on the plot. With delta B4. Um, it turns out that uh, um, uh, delta B4 and delta B5 have a feature that you don't see in delta B3, which is that they involve uh, subspaces. So the four particle subspace is made out of a three and one on one, on one hand, and then a two plus two on the other hand. So you need to resolve those because they enter with different signs. And that's what causes this curvature that where, where the results first go up and then they go down. And the same with delta B5. So I'll, I'll show you those. Um, uh, they appear here. So this is, this is uh, what, what goes into delta B3. It's only one subspace. You only have two plus one particles. It's, it's not a subspace. But for example, for, for the four particle subspace, uh, sorry, four particle sus, uh, space, you have three plus one particles or two plus two particles. And they enter with different sign and similar magnitude. And so that's, that's why you see this cancellation, which needs to be resolved. And you see here uh, also the results from, from the other calculations. Uh, kind of conjectures. Uh, well, this one here is a conjecture, the little one here, and the bigger error bars are the quantum Monte Carlo results. Uh, and, uh, and then these dots out here are, are um, the diagrammatic calculations, which are an approximation, I think, from uh, finite range. Um, and so, so this is, this is uh, then part of the reason why this is, this is a difficult calculation. I'll come back to this uh, when I show you results in a, in a trap, which are our most recent results. Now, armed with these coefficients, uh, we, we could do what we originally set out to do, which is to do something of the sort that you would do with perturbation theory, which is if you can go to high enough order, then you hope that you can do a resummation. You hope that you can ap approach it with resummation techniques. And, uh, and the first results of that are shown here. This is the equation of state at unitarity, the density equation of state at unitarity as function of the fugacity. And uh, you see second order bigger expansion, third order, fourth order, and fifth order. And those are at face value. So you just take this, the virial uh, uh, expansion and you chop it off at third order and fourth order and fifth order and so on. Now, if you resum it instead, you get this dashed line, which uh, we were very happy to see. It compares very well with uh, experiments. Uh, this, this, uh, um, these dots here are the MIT experiments. And now, of course, this is just one type of Padre resummation you can do. And we're exploring various uh, different kinds of Padre resummations you could do. But typically, these are the ones that work best when doing resummations are the ones that are as close as possible to diagonal, like 2, 2, or 3, 3, or 3, 2 are the ones that you would expect to work best. That's uh, entirely uh, empirical evidence uh, that we gather from, from the literature. But this is what we obtained then from for, for 3, 2. 
we generalize this to um, uh, the polarized system. So different uh, chemical potentials for spin up and spin down. And, and again, you see that um, if, you, if you take the real expansion at face value, then, then things start to um, run into trouble uh, back here uh, at, at beta mu of minus one or, or below. But if you apply a resummation technique, then you expand dramatically the applicability of the real expansion. And that, that is uh, something that uh, we, we set out to do, that we wanted to accomplish. And we hope that we can push it as high as perhaps two uh, so we're, we're getting close to one here, but we hope that we can push it to two eventually because there's a, there's a phase transition at 2.5 or 2.4. And so that would be uh, uh, really, uh, really interesting to get to that point. So I can um, just remind you uh, in five minutes to wrap up. Okay, and then five minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think I just said something that in fact uh, was wrong. The, 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 uh, I don't know, extra beta mu of two, that's correct. Actually. Yeah, that's 2.4. Yeah, that's correct. Never mind. Um, good. So, then we went ahead and uh, did the same for a um, for a, the compressibility. Again, we see uh, taking the real expansion at face value is uh, giving you diverging results. But if you resum it, you get much better comparison with uh, other approaches. Bettinger Ward MIT experiment here and complex San Giovanni, uh, much better agreement. Uh, and we then uh, get very excited and try to push this as far as possible. So this is preliminary uh, at this point. We were able to calculate up to seventh order, up to sorry ninth order, and, and apply resummation techniques, and we obtained uh, some uh, various curves here from from uh, doing those resummations. Uh, and, but but it compares well with uh, diagrammatic Monte Carlo by Rossi and colleagues from 2018. So we were happy to see that. But again, we want to push that uh, further as much as possible. And the most recent results that I want to show uh, before my time is up. Um, are uh, the calculations in a harmonic trap where we were able to resolve the uh, frequency, uh, the trap frequency dependence, or if you want, the temperature dependence of the Virga coefficients. So as you take beta omega to zero, then uh, you, you, you approach the um, uniform regime, uh, of course. And this is our, these are our, our results I showed you before, the, uni the uniform limit you obtain this uh, star here. And, uh, and our results for, from this work, which is now in print, up here in, in, uh, in blue uh, from already extrapolating. Uh, the first step and second step in the calculation for k equals one and two are shown here and, and, and dotted in dashed lines. And, uh, and after extrapolation, you get the blue, but also uh, we show here in, um, in, in, in red, the results from, from Jan and Blume uh, from Pacentico Monte Carlo, which are in fantastic agreement here. No problems with Delta V3. So again, no damage here, but we move on to Delta V4. And that's where we start to see some discrepancies which uh, we uh, track, we traced back to um, to to uh, the decomposition in the 31 and 22 subspace. We get very good agreement, but then we start to see here where um, we see some disagreements between our methods. And uh, uh, but I think that those are now resolved. Now now we think we understand this much better. And 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 then uh, we we obtain then this um, 22 uh, result and and 31, which then uh, go to the expected limits. Uh, obtained with the with the previous method entirely in momentum space. So this was done in coordinate space, by the way. And then again, uh, now that we have these results and uh, we get, um, uh, I don't know if uh, we get too enthusiastic or, or just uh, plain carried away, but uh, we went to Delta V5. Uh, and this is my last uh, slide of results. I think this is the first time that, that Delta V5 is, uh, is resolved like this with, uh, uh, with the frequency dependence completely uh, uh, shown. Um, all the way from from zero frequency to 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 some to finite frequency and and beyond this point i think there are approximations that are very good that one could apply and again dotted and dashed here we have our um our first and second order uh, um, values of, of k which which um, give actually a good description out here as well so um and these are also included in the same in the same uh, uh, the same uh, article as as the previous results that was shown so all this is in a trap so that's just to show you, or, or, or if you want to, to brag about a little bit, uh, to brag a little bit about our results uh, uh, in a harmonic trap. And uh, uh, so then to summarize, um, I think this is uh, well understood by this community that nuclear astrophysics and ultra cold atoms need finite temperature, fundamentally by the theory, I think it's beyond any doubt. And we're exploring this computational idea to bridge between entirely numerical approaches and entirely analytic approaches to quantum many body physics using automated algebra. And with this idea, we were able to push 
the VR expansion to new limits um, and, and shed light where uh, previous methods came short or were starting to, uh, to lose precision. And we use our results complemented with resummation techniques to, to access the thermodynamics of strongly coupled matter, in particular at unitarity. And, and then in the future, we hope to generalize that to attractive boost gases that's actually uh, in, in, uh, in the works right now. Harmonically trapped systems I already showed you. And then nuclear matter, in particular neutral matter, um, and observables beyond thermodynamics we're right now working on the, on the real expansion of the structure factor. And, uh, and, and uh, we will continue to push to higher orders uh, as much as possible, uh, applying resummation methods. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. OK, uh, I can thank you very much for the talk. Uh, and uh, I will ask the audience to ask questions. It was right on time. I think Hans Werner. Um, hi, Joaquin. Uh, hi. Thanks for this very nice talk. I, I had a question on what you said in the beginning. Yes. Uh, so you, you mentioned that for a more complicated interaction, you could use the same method by expanding in Gaussians. Uh, do you have some results on how well that actually works? I don't. I don't. I wish I did. But uh, the idea is that, or at least my current naive idea is that um, is that once uh, this point is reached where you need the matrix elements of this object, yeah, um, uh, these matrix elements between, uh, suppose you have just a two body interaction to make it easy, uh, but you can have three body as well. We've done calculations with three body as well, actually, and those are published. But if you have only a two body interaction, then what basically will happen is you have the non interacting piece and the momentum conserving delta, and then this will be momentum dependent. This will depend on P1 minus P2, basically. And you, you have to expand this function in, in uh, in a Gaussian basis. And, and my impression right now is that it would give you a lot more term than what we already have, but it would just be more of the same. It would just be more of the same. And each of these terms are entirely parallelizable. So you just need more computer time. Uh, and it scales linearly with the, um, okay, actually, let me, let me not say that. I don't know exactly how it's going to scale, but that's, that's what you would do. Okay, so I would be interesting to, to see how that works. Absolutely. And in fact, uh, I wanted to mention something that, uh, that, that I, I failed to mention in connection with uh, Francesco's talk. I, I want to say that I'm very happy to see that there's people trying to do imaginary time evolution with quantum computers, because this is what it is. This is what we have here. We're doing imaginary time evolution exactly, but of course with classical computers. Uh, and it's, it's what we have, is what we would do while we wait for quantum computers. right? Uh, and it would be interesting to do that also to approach a ground state. Uh, and we have some of that in the works as well, connected to eigenvector continuation. Uh, but that's a different story. All right, thanks. Okay, so any, any other question from the, from the audience? I, I'm not exactly in the audience, but I have a question. <laughs> okay, go ahead. So, so Joaquin, uh, very nice talk, by the way. Um, these higher order virial coefficients experimentally, you know, very naively, I would expect they're harder and harder to extract. Is that? Absolutely. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it would be very hard to extract that. The, your best hope is, of course, to do the resummation and then compare uh, specific thermodynamic results with whatever uh, people can measure. Now, uh, not just thermodynamics, of course, if you get the structure factor, which in many cases is known at perhaps the specific temperatures, that, that, that's also a good detailed comparison. Uh -huh. Okay, thanks. So any other questions? I will have a question if nobody else has a question. Anyone? I don't want to take my premise here for... Dorte, you'd like to ask a question or you're just getting ready? No one? No, no, go ahead. Okay, so so I'll ask a quick question. Okay. I, I, can you put back the, the, the slide that you compare the the theoretical work and the experiments. Yes, this I one? think the MIT experiments. This night dot curved. No, no, the the, ah, ah, this the one, one with the, yes. with the dots. Yeah. So 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 here, in this thing, I mean the 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 theory that is done here is is in the continuum, right? Ah, good question. Correct. Yeah. So of course, so, we so, have a so the experiments of course are done on on, on the trap, but the agreement is already very very good. Yeah. So so if you add the trap, I mean, what, what happens? I mean, how? How can you get so, better so than that? So this experiment um, obtained, uh, they already removed the trap effects from this experiment. OK. Yeah. yeah. So, so in a way, you do some theory. subtraction scheme of the profile and sort of mimic. Right. That's what they did already. Right. Right. OK. Yeah. 
they, yeah, so, they're so mimicking already done. something. Correct. Okay, but, but that requires some modeling, though, right? So so. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, um, so so so, uh, did you hear from those guys if they are trying to do these experiments on a box potential or something like this, which is you know better, closer to what you have without doing all this modeling yeah, to I'm, get things I'm, out. I believe that is <clears throat> in the works, uh, and 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 I I have not seen. Uh, and this may just be me, I, I, but I have I have right. not seen a result in a in the flat bottom box that is now possible yeah. to to make. Yeah, it, it would be entire. interesting to to see if they, they do it because then then there's no need for that modeling, right? So so right. you know the modeling, yeah, the results okay. we model dependent somehow if they make right, it a little right. bit better. Right. Yeah. So they so, use the LDA, but but I think the consensus in the community is that these results from MIT are basically that's just, that that is not going to change. But you're right. In principle, right. there is that dependence. Yeah. Right. Okay. So any more questions? Maybe sh should go uh, into the next speaker. Thank you, Joaquin, again for yeah, the nice yeah. talk. I think while we have uh, Dirta here, I want to say that that um, I mentioned her results here. I want to say that I'm a fan, and I, I want to thank her for uh, trail uh, starting the trail in this direction. We got got really excited about this, and and really uh, provided a benchmark for us. Okay, wonderful. So so we're gonna have uh, that's a nice uh, transition to our next speaker, right, uh, Dorte. Uh, Blume, she's going to talk about probing the helium dimer and trimer with fast, intense lasers. So, Dorothy, you have 20 minutes and then five minutes to wrap up and five minutes for questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Carlos. Um, I think you can see just the title slide, is that right? We can see. Okay. We can also right. see either table of contents at the bottom, like the other. Might want to enlarge okay. a little that, bit if you like. That's probably OK. OK, um, okay. so um, yeah, so, thank so you If you want to enlarge much. a little bit to go in slide mode, in presentation mode, it probably would be easier to see. If you go at the very bottom, there's a choice. The presentation mode, right, right, all the way at the bottom, yeah. Uh, the right, the right, the right. There's this presentation, yeah, here. Yeah, I, I can do this, yeah. Good. So thank you to the organizers for the um, invitation. So it's really nice uh, to be here at the workshop. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to tell you a little bit about um, a few body problem. In particular, we are looking at the helium dimer and helium trimer. And we are essentially bombarding these uh, small molecules with fast and intense lasers. And the theory credit for this really goes to Ching Zigran, a former postdoc, really talented former postdoc in my group. And then the credit for the experimental work really goes to uh, Maxim Kunitsky in Reinhard Dörner's group. So what I'm gonna tell you about is um, the two body system and there we're looking at real time dynamics and then the three body system where we're looking at the FMOF state and that's gonna be a stationary study. In the experiments, um, the systems are prepared um, in a size-selected nozzle beam expansion experiment. And so the key idea is that we have a nozzle down here on the uh, right. And then um, by sending things through a grading, the uh, beam can be split up into monomers, dimers, and trimers. And then by shining additional laser light onto the system, um, these uh, dimers, trimers, and so on can be probed. Um, for the dimer, we're really looking at pump probe experiments. And for the trimer, we essentially just do the probe. So we don't actually uh, prepare the system in an excited state via the pump. Um, to start with, at least not at this point. Eventually, what we'd like to do is we would also like to look at the dynamics of the uh, FMOF uh, trimer. So in, in a way, what you can do is you can sort of think about what we're doing here as uh, combining two fields. Uh, we take intense, uh, fast, intense lasers. So these are femtosecond lasers. 
we are shining them onto a universal system. So a system that's governed by a large less wave scattering lengths. And uh, we are combining these and, you know, sort of uh, two ways of looking at this one way you might say, okay, you know, two things combined should really be better than two things uh, separate. Um, on the other hand, you might also sort of take a more negative viewpoint and say, hey, aren't you just going to blow everything up? I mean, if you have these very delicate, weakly bound states initially, and now we shine an um, ultra-fast, intense laser onto the system, so we're looking at about 10 to the 14 watts per square centimeters here. Aren't we just going to blow everything up? And the, the point here is, yes, we are actually blowing stuff up. And it's fun and it's useful. And this response is really going to tell us about the uh, system. And I, I also want to mention that this work is sort of in a broader context. Um, ultra cold, cold or ultra cold systems uh, have been combined by others with fast intense lasers, um, either to simulate. Um, system sort of using one to simulate the other or to uh, using um, lasers to say prepare um, the cold system in a particular uh, superposition state. So we, we are not the first ones, but I think we are looking at this in a unique way. And the talk today is really looking at this atomic systems, these uh, helium uh, clusters or small molecules. And the idea is that hopefully we can eventually transfer ideas uh, to nuclear physics and condensed matter physics. So when I'm talking about the helium dimer, you might uh, think about the deuteron um, just you know, in terms of um, a visionary picture. You know, ideally, one would like to do similar things with the deuteron and then in the pre-body sector, the uh, triton. And then thinking about condensed matter uh, systems, you know, maybe uh, one can think about um, in the three-body sector, trions, although their, their states are not universal. So one might alternatively think about some um, effective systems, sort of magnonic systems or spin systems that have also been predicted um, to exhibit FMOF uh, physics. So hopefully the, you know, the, the sort of what comes out of this down the road is that really these uh, dynamical few body uh, studies can be transferred to the nuclear and the condensed matter um, sector. So what I want to do is I could just start off by telling you, introducing you a little bit to the helium system. Not all of you might be familiar with this. Looking at the helium dimer, and here I'm really particularly talking about um, two helium-4 atoms, so two bosonic atoms. Um, that dimer system supports exactly one bound state. It's a weakly bound state. There are no rotationally excited states, and that's going to be important for the remainder of this talk. And this dimer is characterized by an S-wave scattering length of the order of 204. And the important point here is that the scattering length is really about an order of magnitude larger than the effective range. And so it's really this large scattering length that's, that provides the um, initial nearly universal state of the system that we're interested in. And then what we want to see is, okay, if you now bombard this dimer that's universal to start with, what happens? Um, how does this uh, intense laser, how does the uh, pump um, laser um, that's grabbing on in a very short distance uh, regime, sort of in the sort of up to 10 bore or so internuclear distance regime. How is this uh, intense laser, what, what, what sort of superposition state is this placing the dimer in? And then at the, in the second part of the talk, I'm going to tell you about the trimer. And in particular there, we're going to look at the excited trimer um, the three-body the, the, um, three system has exactly two uh, bound states, and we will be focusing on the excited state, which turns out to be um, an FMOF state. And just to sort of put these binding energies of the dimer and the excited trimer, which are of the order of a millikelvin into context, 
um, remind you that the binding energy per particle of liquid helium, so the bulk system is minus seven Kelvin. So the small few body systems are really distinctly different from the large bulk system where we have a quantum liquid. Okay, so experimentally, how are these um, systems prepared? I mentioned it already a little bit. We have a molecular beam. Um, the beam gets sent through a grating and that grating splits um, the beam up into monomers, which are really dominating dimers and trimers. It's, better, it's essentially a meta wave diffraction experiment where the cluster size is determining this uh, angle here. And this means that we really have size selection. And this is very important for um, the following. So this is just a, um, sort of one of the earlier um, experiments. This is um, the first evidence that uh, unambiguous evidence that the helium dimer is truly bound. This wasn't actually established um, up to 1994 unambiguously. This pioneering work by Shokop and Tonyas. And so um, what they looked at is exactly this sort of a molecular beam experiment. And uh, you already see on the top panel here that we have a logarithmic scale for the uh, signal. And you see a lot of monomer peaks. So it's first order, second order, third order, and so on. And then if you look very, very, very carefully in between, you see these small, tiny shoulders. And that's really the signal of the dimer. So you have to look quite carefully the production of the dimers can be enhanced, enhanced a little bit by changing the pressure and temperature of your nozzle. And then if the uh, nozzle temperature and pressure are adjusted and you look a little bit more carefully and, and, and you work with the system more, again, this is a logarithmic scale here as a function of the angle. You really see a dimer peak, a trimer peak, a tetramer peak, and so on. And you can actually adjust the relative production of, of these uh, few body systems by changing your nozzle conditions. Um, at least to some degree, you can adjust this. So what we want to do is to start with, we want to look at the dimers. And as I said, what we want to do is we want to do pump probe spectroscopy. So what I'm showing here is uh, just I'm focusing on the dimer beam here. The pump uh, laser is uh, relatively long. So in this context, relatively long means 310 femtosecond. And the probe laser is much more intense and significantly shorter. So what, what um, is happening here, so essentially what is happening is that the uh, pump laser is um, sort of exciting the dimer in some way. And then the probe laser is essentially just ripping off the electrons, uh, leaving behind two ions and the ions are repel each other. This is referred to as Coulomb explosion. And essentially, although it's a little bit more complicated, but essentially what uh, this Coulomb explosion allows us is it allows one to reconstruct the initial state that one had just prior to application of the uh, probe pulse. And that's what we're gonna um, take advantage of. And what I'm gonna uh, show you is what happens as a function of the delay time. So it's really the delay between the pump and the probe that we're gonna change here. And before I go into the results for the helium dimer, I just want to show you what, what one uh, sort of gets for a heavier molecule. I've chosen the N2 as an example here. N2 is sort of a rigid rotor molecule. The intensities used in this study are very similar to what we are using. Um, the pulses, um, this pulse length here, in the impulse regime, it just means basically that even though the um, probe, the pump pulse is relatively long in what I showed you before, it's still essentially acting as an impulse. And then uh, what happens in this case is we actually, one sees rotational revivals. And these rotational revivals 
a direct consequence of the fact that the rotational energy spectrum has a very, very simple form. So it's essentially what you see here is that you have constructive interference of uh, the phase. On the other hand, if you're in the adiabatic regime, so you turn your pulse on really slowly and then turn it off again, then you, know, you just excite the molecule and you go back to where you started. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna work in the impulse, impulse regime. However, if um, you look at the uh, helium dimer, then keep in mind that we don't actually have any rotationally excited states. So what we expect is we expect things to be significantly different from these rigid rotor type molecules. And indeed, this is what we see. So on the top, you see experimental data. At the bottom, you see parameter-free theory. And the observable here is this cosine squared theta. This is the so-called alignment measure that I also showed on the previous page. If this alignment measure is one third, it means that essentially you don't have any deformation or alignment of the molecule. So the laser beam did not lead to a polarization. Okay, so what we've changed here is we've changed the delay time uh, from zero to 40 picoseconds. And this alignment is actually shown as a function of the helium-helium distance. So when the delay time is small, you see that this alignment signal is located at short internuclear distances. That's exactly where the um, pump laser grabs on. And then as time, as the delay time is increased, what you see is that this alignment signal is really spreading out expand or going outward to larger internuclear distances. And you see one you might refer to as a just beautiful interference pattern. And indeed, our theory analysis shows that what we see is here, we do see that the, this sort of uh, alternating pattern of green and blue, that this is due to the interference between two different partial wave components of, components of our wave packet the very broad rotationless ground state, the JS0 state, and the JS2 um, rotationally excited state. So we're working here in a regime where the pump laser only essentially, I mean, excites the JS2 component, so no higher rotationally excited states. And also I should emphasize this, the um, pump laser is such that it leaves the electronic degrees of freedom intact. So we can treat each of the helium atoms as a composite boson. And what we only have to worry about is the rotational and vibrational degrees of freedom. And what you see here is a rich interplay between the rotational and the vibrational degrees of freedom. And that's really distinctly different from the rigid rotor molecules uh, like N2 or I2 where the distance between the uh, two atoms remains the same during the um, dynamics, during the delay. So this is very nice. Uh, we are very happy about the agreement here. And it's really the first time that an intense laser has been used to look at a molecular state where the initial state is governed, uh, is universal, that is really governed by um, the large S wave scattering lengths. And so what, what these experiments and the supporting theory show is that even the rotationless helium dimer, so by rotationless here, I just mean that there's no excited um, rotation, um, excited state supported by the dimer, that even this rotationless helium dimer can be aligned. Um, what we see is we see the excitation um, or we, we sort of see a continuum portion of the wave packet that's in the JS2 state. And then that's actually dissociating. And the other interesting thing here is that essentially because uh, we only have two different partial wave components that are occupied, essentially what this means is that we really have a spatially and temporally resolved measurement of the relative phase between the two different partial wave channels. So we are essentially doing state tomography here 
and it's a spatially and temporarily resolved state tomography. I'd say there, there are many outstanding challenges. So what we would like to do is we would really like to extend this and possibly look at resonances as an ultra cold atoms. To do this, we need longer pulses. And we would also like to look at uh, time dependent interaction strengths. Again, we, we need to have um, longer pulses for this and, and um, sort of possibly combine different pulses. And, and really what we would like to do is we would like to look at the dynamics of three body systems, larger um, systems, um, in particular, the FM of trimer. We don't have any results on this at this point, but what I can show you is that with these um, molecular beam experiments, the excited FM of state of the helium trimer can be populated. So sort of coming back to our helium system here, the introduction I had, Remember, there's this uh, excited state of the helium trimer. There's just one excited state, and its binding energy is of the same order of magnitude as the binding energy of the dimer. And what I want to show you now is sort of a measurement first that shows that this uh, FM of state is really bound and exists, can be realized in these molecular beam experiments. And then I show you um, structural properties of the stationary FM of uh, trimer in the helium system. So this is the um, sort of FM of plot. On the x-axis, we have essentially one over the scattering lengths. Actually, it's one over the square root of the scattering lengths here. The unitary regime, so this is the regime that Joachim focused on in his talk, but he talked about fermions, um, is in the middle here. So this is unitarity. And then we have the uh, binding energy here on the um, y-axis. And this is just the generic uh, general uh, three-body scenario. That's really beautifully discussed in this review by uh, Braten and um, Hammer. And I just what... remind you, five, five minutes uh, oh, to wrap up. Okay. Five minutes. Thank you. So we have these universally linked um, geometrically spaced trimer states. So as I said, we have scattering lengths here on the x-axis, or essentially scattering lengths. And to make these three-body plots, the only additional input that is needed is one three-body parameter. So this could be, for example, the position of, say, one of these three atom thresholds or the atom dimer threshold or the binding energy of one of these trimers at unitarity. OK, so there's this uh, nice geometrically spaced sequence of three-body states. How does this connect to the helium trimer? The helium, trim the helium system supports uh, three, two three-body bound states. There's the ground state here in green, and there's the excited state. And the uh, ground state does not quite fit um, super nicely on the solid line, the universal theory, but the excited state does. And so this is uh, just telling us that the three body, the excited state is an FM of state. And this has been studied by many people. This goes back to the 70s. So these are uh, comparisons of experiment and theory. This is from the molecular beam experiment where we don't have a, a pump. We only have the probe laser. And what is plotted here is the kinetic energy release. The kinetic energy release is essentially one over the sum of one over the internuclear distances. So this means that a small kinetic energy release corresponds to a large internuclear distance. And these red dots here from the experiments, which are followed by the um, theory calculations, that is the evidence for the excited helium trimer in the experiment. This blue curve that's cut off 
continues all the way over here. And that is really the signature of the ground state. So the first message here is that the helium trimer excited state can be observed. We can do a lot more analysis on it uh, since we do have the kinetic energy release and we can measure the, in the experiments, what Maxime measured is really the momenta of each of the uh, ions that's flying away in the Coulomb explosion. One can reconstruct the initial state this is just one example. This is the pair distribution function of the helium trimer excited state. And then just to give you one more um, observable that we looked at and that I think is interesting here. This is um, what we refer to as normalized structures. So what we do is we take um, the three body system. We look at different possible configurations, either from the theory calculations or the experiment. The two figures on the left compare the normalized configurations for the excited state. They're very similar between theory and experiment and distinctly different from the uh, trimer ground state. So this is just sort of a first very naive visual uh, argument that the trimer excited state is really distinctly different from the ground state. And so the ground state does not have the full characteristics of the uh, FMOF state. And uh, if you look at you know, what we flooded here a little bit more, then essentially what we do is we take the longest distance and we normalize every, everything by the longest distance of the trimer. And then we are plotting where the third particle is. And so the helium trimer excited state is really, you know, it's very diffuse when it's sort of leaning toward a diffuse elongated triangle. So what I told you about are two things. One, we looked at the uh, helium trimer excited state, looked at stationary characteristics, and we can really look at the uh, density of an FM of trimer. So that's very exciting. And then um, in the first part, I talked about the helium dimer case where we really looked at um, time dependent uh, measurements and uh, theory. So really looking in the dynamical regime at the few body level with uh, single atom resolution. And the key tool on the experimental side was this Coulomb explosion imaging, uh, which really allows for the visualization of the quantum mechanical density. And the many next steps, what we like to do is really look at the uh, helium four, so four helium four atoms, look at the excited state, and then, you know, really extend the dynamical studies into the three body sector, into the four body sector and, and look at weakly bound complexes with single atom resolution. Um, I also want to mention really nice work in the ultra cold regime. I didn't have time to mention all the really nice earlier work on ultra cold systems that looked at FMOF physics um, from Rudy Grimm's group. Francesca Ferlino and, and many other groups. And with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention and just point out that the theory work was done by Ching Zhuguan, really good postdoc, and then acknowledge Maxime and Reinhardt's contributions on the experimental side again. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dorothy, for the nice talk. We open uh, the floor for questions. So maybe I'll, I'll start with one, so to get the people to, to ask something. So, 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 uh, Dorothy, in, 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 in those in those experiments, let's say, uh, people confined to the case of, of, of course of helium. Uh, those are things that are hard to bind. They're hard experiments, hard theory. Uh, are the other uh, elements of of the periodic table 
of the helium group like argon or other noble gases that people have tried to, to study the formation of these objects using the same techniques. And yes. So, so I think if I understand your question correctly, you're asking whether- The other noble gases. Uh, these, I mean, uh, yeah. How hard it is so, to, to, to create trimers of those and, 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 and tetramers and so on. No, of course, it's or even dimers. Uh, actually it's it's much easier because mm -hmm. those systems are much more strongly bound. Right. So mm -hmm. say, you know, for the neon um, dimer, there are, there are, you know, many more bound states and for the trimer as well. And some of these systems have been um, studied in these um, molecular beam experiments and have also been Coulomb exploded. So the, um, you know, from sort of my perspective um, in this context of the conference, they're not as interesting because they don't have the universal feature of a large scattering length. And, you know, this means that the sort of insights gained from these systems, um, you will likely not be able to carry over to nuclear systems, right? Okay, so the point here is that you focus on that exactly because of the uniqueness of the system uh, in that regard. Yeah, so what, what we want to, to sort of see is, you know, if you um, look at the dynamics of, um, uh, you know, few body states that are universal, so characterized by the S-wave scattering lengths. Is there anything or what can you learn um, by looking at the dynamic response, right? So Joe, for example, talked yesterday about um, the dynamics, you know, what, what's the response? I mean, he was looking at the uh, linear response, but what's the response of many body systems? And so we're sort of coming at this question from the few body perspective, where you really have essentially the ability to fully reconstruct the either the density or even the uh, wave function or the wave packet. And you know, that that's sort of pretty neat. And that that's one of the tools we have to really look at uh, what 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 the quantum systems look like. So anybody else like to ask a question? Well maybe I just make a uh, one one final comment. Um, you know, okay. thank you, Joachim, for the nice talk on the virial coefficients. And, you know, at least from my perspective, this is, you know, one other example where this interplay from few body and many body physics uh, has been really rich. And so even though what I talked about today is a sort of a, a rather different system and, and, you know, looking at things very, you know, in the time domain, I think at the end of the day, it's really in a similar spirit in that we are trying to look at the microscopic um, correlations in some sense and trying to see at the end of the day, how can those explain some of the features in the many body sector in addition to being interesting in their own right. So thanks okay. Joachim. Okay, so let's thank uh, Dorte again for a nice talk and we invite next uh, <clears throat> Jakob Carrizotto uh, to, to talk about quantum hall fluids of atoms and of light. So Jakob, you're gonna have 20 minutes plus five and then five for questions. So thank you. Very good, thanks Carlos for the introduction. Let me start sharing the slides. Can you see the front slide? Yeah, we can see the slides. So. Very good. So, thanks a lot for the uh, invitation to this uh, interesting workshop. And today, what I'm going to uh, to present is a completely different system, where in the last few years uh, there's been uh, some very interesting and exciting steps in the direction of studying many body physics. And these fluids are fluids of atom, but most importantly, fluids 
of light. So uh, everything started with uh, the, the well-known affection of quantum ball effect, which basically consists in very peculiar features in the uh, transverse and longitudinal resistance of uh, an electron system, which is subject to a strong confinement to a 2D plane and a strong magnetic, static magnetic field. In particular, depending on the value of the magnetic field applied to the system, one can recognize very flat plateaus in the whole resistance, in the transverse resistance, associated to zeros in the longitudinal um, resistivity. And these are located at the integer or rational values of the, uh, the feeling factor of each Landau level. So this is a physics which is uh, very exciting and it's in its fractional version is dominated by like, interactions between electrons. So the question from which uh, I started my interest in this physics is whether this physics is specific to electrons or can it can be observed in other systems such as uh, quantum fluids of light. So the short summary of this talk is uh, the first part will be a review of uh, linear topological optics, which basically means uh, how to make photons to feel some Lorentz force, uh, like quantum particles uh, in a static magnetic field. The second part, uh, I will discuss how these uh, topological optics can be combined to, with optical nonlinearities and with gain to, to obtain uh, some peculiar effects of interest for technological applications, such as uh, topological lasers. And in the last part, we sketch the present perspectives into the realization of quantum uh, systems with strong interaction between photons, which basically means very strong optical nonlinearities. So the first part, basically goes through this, uh, shortly goes through this uh, review paper that we mm, published uh, together with this uh, dream team of colleagues on the basics of topological uh, photonics. So the prehistory of all this business goes back to uh, synthetic gate fields for atoms, which are basically uh, some developments into the realization of uh, uh, magnetic fields for neutral particles uh, such as atoms. Yesterday, is, yesterday there's been several uh, talks in this workshop uh, dealing with uh, how atoms can be uh, made to experience uh, such uh, effective magnetic fields. And here is a summary of different uh, uh, schemes to obtain this effect, which is basically either to rotate an atomic cloud, to create uh, a combination of Raman and inhomogeneous magnetic field. This gives rise to creation of spontaneous vertices, shaken lattices or laser seated hopping in lattice models, or other ways to use so-called synthetic dimensions to increase the effective dimensionality of the atomic system. So this slide, this basically summarizes the ways where uh, atoms can be made to fill a magnetic field. But in the last decade or so, there's been a very strong push into the development of similar techniques for photons, which are the sort of the most neutral object that one can imagine in a physical theory. And all this business of magnetic fields for photons started with this proposal by Duncan Haldane, who basically realized that suitably designed photonic crystals, so suitably designed periodic arrangements of dielectric materials, can give rise to photonic bands for uh, in this periodic system with non-trivial uh, with non-trivial uh, topological uh, properties. So this basically mm, in this uh, in this work showed that the integer quantum wall effect does not really depend on the fermionic nature of uh, electrons, but rather on the geometrical properties of these uh, block bands for photons. And in this way, the following experiment in the group of Marine Soliacic basically showed the possibility of having a topological system for light in the bulk 
which shows unidirectionally propagating states on the edge of the system, where basically light can propagate from antenna A to antenna B, but cannot propagate back from antenna B to antenna A in a very unidirectional propagating uh, scheme. So from A to B, but not from B to A. So this was, uh, this is an example of uh, uh, propag unidirectional propagating edge state and its presence can be related to the so-called churn number of one band. In particular here, you have a ground, a fundamental band with no churn number, zero churn number, but the first band is a churn number of one, which means that there exists a topologically protected edge state linking the first band to the following band. And this experiment was done just by measuring the transmission of electromagnetic waves from one antenna to the other and showed that one direction gives a significant transmission, the other direction shows absolutely no transmission. So this is a way to uh, break time reversal for photonic waves, which is very interesting for no reciprocal behaviors. And the first experiment was done with uh, microwaves. Then has been a strong quest to extend the same physics for visible photons. And here, the sketch of the first two experiments in this direction, using uh, pigtail uh, shaped waveguides, which are a sort of uh, uh, floquet insulator for, for light, or a hyperofset model for light with cavities with hopping, which has a non-trivial phase, which depends on the lattice size. Again, the experimental signature of this non-trivial topology is the propagation from input to output goes in this direction, but there cannot be transmission from output to input because the mode, optical mode, only travels in this counterclockwise direction around the system. Very interestingly, if one puts a defect along the edge, light does not reflect back on a defect as it normally happens in light, which reflects onto any kind of uh, defect in vacuum, but rather goes around the defect and keeps propagating in the same direction as it happens for a chiral propagation system, unidirectional propagation. Good, and these are all these physics that can be explained in terms of a bulk edge correspondence between the churn number of the bands in the bulk and the existence of edge states going around the system. So uh, this was uh, for the edge. There's been, in the meanwhile, also a lot of activity in the direction of measuring the geometrical properties of the bulk. And here is an example of experiment. The details are a bit complicated. I have no time to, to go through them. But the bottom line is that uh, using a system as simple as a pair of optical fibers, one can uh, look at the propagation of a series of pulses. And from the time delay of these uh, pulse, one can extract the uh, geometrical properties of uh, photonic bands in the system, and then uh, extract the topological invariance. Good. So, what can be done with these topological systems? Of course, the one directional propagation along uh, the edge of the system is a very interesting thing. And it's something which can have uh, an interesting interest for applications. In the sense that having something which propagates unidirectionally uh, means that one has an object which behaves in optical isolator. So something which propagates light, let light propagate in one direction, but does not let light propagate in the opposite direction. But what is more uh, fashionable these days is these so-called topological laser that people in condensed matter can also consider, uh, understand as a non-equilibrium Bose-Einstein condensation phenomenon in a chiral edge state. So in an unidirectional propagating edge state. So the idea is to take a topological model like the one which is shown here or here, provide it with gain and look at light which is emitted by this gain material. In suitable condition, one can get the edge of the system to laser. In particular, one sees here 
that light lasers in a mode which travels around the system in this counterclockwise direction. Here there is an out output coupler which takes part of the light and let it propagate outside along this one dimensional fiber, which then is, can, be, can then be used for uh, applications. Here is another example of device which basically does the same. It emits in a mode which propagates counterclockwise and goes out towards this output port. So this is an example of a topological laser, which is a laser based on a topological system. So what is the characteristic of this topological lasing? So uh, basically the key uh, observation is that one with suitable pumping scheme, one can laser in the topological edge state, which lives around the system and propagates in a single direction. This propagation is actually immune to this order is an efficient single mode laser with a very high slope efficiency, which means that very much of the energy which is pumped in the system goes into laser emission and not into some other spurious channel. So it's a device which emits light with a good efficiency. This, seem, this, seem, this system seems to work very well as we have seen in the previous slide, but raises a lot of interesting fundamental questions. In particular here, the question is, what are the ultimate limitations of the coherence of such a device? In particular, how robust is the coherence against disorder? And what is the advantage over standard lasers? In order to characterize the coherence of such an object, one can go back to the general theory of uh, coherence in a standard extender, specially extended laser system, and one knows that this can be mapped into the Kardar Parisi Zhang model of non equilibrium statistical mechanics so that the spatial temporal scaling of the phase coherence follows some universal laws with a stretched exponential form of uh, the coherence. So here we have some examples of these coherence, which goes from a stretched exponential at intermediate times towards in, uh, a very long time limit of a Charlottetown's, um, Charlottetown's line limit. People who are familiar with the laser theory recognize the Charlottetown's exponential decay at very long time, which is something which is well known from standard laser theory. But before that, there is uh, this other uh, Kada Parisi Zhang uh, decay with a different power law in the stretched exponential which is a signature of complicated non-equilibrium statistical mechanics phenomena. So here, all this physics seems very similar to the one of normal 1D chains, but the key point is that this coherence is very immune to static disorder, which is present in the system. So a non-topological system plotted here, a weak disorder completely suppresses the temporal coherence, here along the X, we have the amount of disorder. On the Y, there is the coherence time. And you see that the blue and green lines, which are for the, um, for the uh, non-topological system, a relatively small disorder basically quenches the coherence time. While for the red line, which is for the two-dimensional hyper of state uh, topological system, there is a coherence up to disorder, which is a very large amount. So basically a disorder which is comparable with the interside hopping rate. So up to this value, there is, uh, there is coherence. So which means that the system is very much immune to any fabrication disorder, which is very interesting for applications where any device is forcibly, uh, forcibly has some uh, built-in disorder because of uh, fabrication issues. So uh, you see this is a technological importance of topological photonics for applications in, uh, in optoelectronics. So from the point of view of uh, a fundamental science workshop, perhaps it's good to enter into the, uh, the more fundamental questions, which is uh, uh, stimulated by the fractional hole physics. So the idea is, uh, 
Can one realize in these topological systems some interesting strongly correlated the fluid of life, the fluid of many interacting forms? So perhaps you're, you're, you're uh, very much surprised from the idea of a strongly interacting photon gas. If you, because if you remember Maxwell's equations, these are normally linear equations, so non-interacting particles. So having strong interactions require that photons become effectively impenetrable objects. And in order to have this, one needs some strong interaction between photons. And this can normally be done by the so-called photon blockade idea, where one has a cavity, whose line width is so good and the nonlinearity is so large, then the presence of a single photon in the cavity is able to shift the frequency of the cavity by an amount which is large as compared to the cavity line width. So that the resonance of the cavity is shifted by the nonlinearity by an amount which basically is enough to push the, the next resonance away from resonance with the incident laser so that the laser is able to inject a single photon, but not the second one. So that because the second transition is effectively out of resonance with the two photon state. In this way, one can inject a single photon in the cavity, but not two photons, and photons behave as effectively impenetrable objects. So if one combines this photon blockade with the synthetic cage field, one can expect to be able to realize the fractional quantum hole fluid of photons. Here are theoretical calculations done by Onur. Here generalization to a cylindrically symmetric cavity. And here is an experiment which has been done recently in the group by John Simon at Chicago, who has used a cylindrically symmetric cavity design with a ring cavity which is non-planar so that parallel transport along the this, uh, ring cavity results in an effective synthetic magnetic field for photons, which leads to effective Landau levels for photons, and then including interactions to the possibility of observing Laughlin states of light. Here, for instance, are experimental data for a two photon state, uh, Laughlin state of light, obtained in such a cavities. So the idea, uh, the signature of having a Laughlin state basically is this, uh, uh, this uh, decay of the coherence when photons are located at the same time, which basically photons which are located at the same position in space. And we know from the general theory of uh, Laughlin states that Laughlin states are states where, for, where particles do not interact because the repulsive interactions are enough to push particles away from each other. Here, sorry, here is the experiment in real space, but in momentum space, the, these uh, correlations of the Laughlin state correspond to anti-bunching for a single mode emission and strong bunching in two states at different angular momentum so that the eigenstate of this two photon system is a linear combination of having two particles in the same state, L equals six, and a combination of having one particle in three and one particle in nine in a, in a coherent way. And the coherence is indeed visible in this real space pattern. And this is a baby Laughlin state formed by two photons, but here in this theoretical calculation, we showed that indeed this method can be scaled up to larger amounts of photons. The big question is now how to generate larger amounts of uh, photons in the state to go towards the direction of having microscopically populated the Laughlin state of light. And the trick, which is now nowadays under a strong exploration from the theoretical and experimental point of view, is to use the so-called frequency-dependent incoherent pumps, which in the laser language mean to use a gain media with a very narrow emission line. Emission line. In this way, one can spectrally favor the generation of a Laughlin, st Laughlin state and exploit the many body gap, which is on top of a Laughlin state, to forbid uh, excitations on top of it. 
So in this way, one can one expect to be able to prepare a Latin state with a very high purity. So no, just just to uh, so five yeah. minutes to wrap up, okay? Yes, yes, yes. So the big another big question is how to use these systems to propose the dynamics of fractional quantum pole states. Here are some preliminary experiments done on a circuit the QD platform where the group at Google was able to, to show the interplay of strong interactions and strong magnetic fields. And here are some uh, theoretical calculations to show that uh, the elementary excitation of such gas show some uh, single particle and two particle physics, which is compatible to the one which is expected from fractional uh, excitations, where the charge, effective charge is fractional and also the effective statistics is the one intermediate between boson and fermions, which is typical for anionic particles. So here is a short summary of what has been done in the fluids of light. We have uh, one, one body particles in synthetic gauge fields for light, which has been nowadays kind of well understood topics. There's been a topological lasing, which is an archetypal example of nonlinear topological optics phenomenon, where this can be used to study quantum effects in non equilibrium stat mech, such as the Kadapa Zhang physics. And the new frontier is to develop strongly correlated gases of uh, photons in a, a strongly correlated regime with strong nonlinearity. And the holy grail is to detect, to generate a fractional quantum mole fluids of light and to exploit the uh, exotic properties as a platform for a lot of interesting many body and quantum information physics. So if you want to know more about this, we have these uh, three review papers, which summarize the advance of these physics in the last years. So have a look at them. There is a lot of uh, hopefully interesting uh, insight. And if you are really interested and you want to spend a week together with us, we are going to organize next summer an in-person summer school in Varenna on the Como Lake, where these physics of quantum fluids of light and matter will be presented by the world, world experts. Here is a list of the lecturers and it would be the possibility of very intense and exciting discussions. So I expect some of you will apply to this uh, summer school. With this, I thank you again for your uh, attention and I'm here ready to, to answer to your questions. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the nice talk. We open the floor for questions. So let me start then because I, I think people are a bit shy now. So, so in the case of, of, of the of the photon states, I mean, so so effectively uh, in those cases, you don't really need uh, to to give a photon a mass, right, to create those those uh, quantum Hall states. So you just try to give to it some effective charge. Yes, you need uh, to have the effective charge. And in that way, the important point is to obtain some flat Landau levels. Mm -hmm. That's the basic, uh, the basic problem, to have some uh, Landau-like levels or to have a hyper of stator model. So you don't bother giving the photon a mass. You can just create a lattice for photons where the hopping between sites experiences a non-trivial phase. In that way, you can create topological state. Yeah. Okay, good. I have more questions, but I can talk privately. Uh, uh, I have any, a question. Anybody else? Paivi, please. Yes. Hi, Jacopo. Thanks for a great talk. Mm -hmm. um, so, mm, so you, you were a bit quick discussing this. Um, 
time scales that are needed uh, for going from the uh, basically from the KPZ dynamics to the exponential salad image. So what would they be in a real <laughs> experimental time scales, let's say? And there was some gamma times T, so what is this gamma? Okay, so basically the, the point is that uh, the transition between KPZ to Charlottetowns occurs at a time which gets longer and longer as the size of the system increases. Okay. okay. So here you see, this is the scaling of the coherence time as a function of the, of the length of the system. Mm -hmm. Here up to some point, it scales like Charlottetowns, and then it departs at the long, uh, long sizes, which basically means that it stays KPC up to long, some time, and then afterwards it becomes a Charlottetown. Yes. Basically, it becomes Charlotte Towns, where the time is so long that you no longer resolve the, the time it takes to go around the system. Yeah. yeah. Basically, the yeah. system behaves as a single mode system, effectively. Yes, yes. And I, uh, how, how is this uh, related to, let's say, present day experiments? Are they big enough so, so that you can push the time kind of? So actually, I cannot present it uh, now because I'm now finalizing the manuscript. It will show oh. out in a few days. And uh, using a Politon system, which is a much dirtier system with all the difficulties of the case, we were able, it's actually uh, Quentin Fontaine and Jacqueline Bloch, were able to detect KPC physics in a small window of times and distances. Before that, uh, there was just the non-universal microscopic physics. Mm -hmm. And after that, uh, there is uh, a sort of uh, uh, towns like stuff uh, with a bit uh, of garbage in between. So it's not really exponential. It becomes Gaussian, mm -hmm. much shorter. Uh, but anyway, it's a faster decay, which basically happens when uh, the, uh, the, co the, the time of the perturbation had the time to touch the edges. Mm -hmm. so as long as the physics is a bulk physics, it's KPZ. When uh, the time in the coherence time, in coherence time is so long that the excitation had the time to touch the edges, then you go into a, a single mode physics, which is Charlottetown or Gaussian. Okay. Okay. So if I remember, I will send you the preprint as soon as it is out. Okay, and then but, uh, yeah, I may forget, so, but it will be in the time. So experimentally, you say you are saying it that was experiment. Sorry. It was an experiment in yeah. uh, politics yeah. with also the theory, and the theory was done uh, using our usual GP-like model, mm -hmm. okay. adapted to the experimental system. Yeah, very nice. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, baby. Okay, so then uh, what we, we, we can do is then get the word to Paivi then to, mm -hmm. to wrap up for the discussion. She's gonna be leading us through the things and hopefully if we have some, some of the speakers for today. Oh, there's a, there's a quick question, Yanni. Uh, maybe you wanna ask do, doing the Paivi's thing. I don't know if somebody raised their hand here. Anyway, Paivi, you take the words and you lead the discussion now. Uh, hopefully we have mm -hmm. some more questions to the speakers or more comments from you. Yeah, yeah. So, um, well, Francesca is not anymore here, but uh, I would like to ask uh, you, especially the nuclear physics exper experts, that uh, is the super solidity somehow relevant um, in the nuclear physics or high energy context? Like, uh, could it, could that kind of uh, phenomena appear there? I'm just curious. Because super fluidity is, of course, very relevant, but some kind of crystalline on top. Well, if you unfortunately, all the experts, I, as far as I can see, of, of neutron stars uh, oh, are gone. They, but they I, are I, I, think, I think it may be relevant uh, for, <laughs> for neutron stars. Oh, then we could speculate freely. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. without being afraid of. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, 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 
I think there's some thoughts that, that may that may be uh, important also uh, in neutron star uh, structures in competing with you know you can think about an FF or LO states if you use this broader definition right mm -hmm. as as being some kind of super solid although you know nobody would call that in the past uh, being yeah. a super solid as nobody would call a yeah, vortex yeah, lattice yeah, yeah. being a super yeah, solid. You are right that. If, if uh, thing has been considered, you right? Know. I mean, it, yeah. but you know, so you have to, 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 uh, yeah. So if you use a broader definition of, of coexistence or inhomogeneous order parameter plus mm -hmm. the backgrounds for fluidity, let's say, yeah. right? So, yeah. so those at least the FF or LO type states are expected in neutron stars. That I know for sure. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and if you want to call that a super solid, then it's, you know, it's up to what definition you want to use. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think most people, experts on that, uh, other people can pitch in. There's a lot of stuff in neutron star. There's solid crust, there's a liquid region. So um, but definitely not in the usual sense. I think people are not thinking in the usual sense that you have a real solid with defects, mm -hmm. like was yeah. the original proposal of a super solid. Yes. Just my two cents. Mm -hmm. So Carlos, could you elaborate on that when you say uh, uh, a real solid with defects? Because, you know, people do study, you know, dislocations or whatever. For right, right. So the, I, the original idea, right, was uh, uh, was that, that, uh, that uh, uh, the, the big question was, could you have a solid, uh, actual solid state Mera, right? Helium four in a solid state, mm -hmm. uh, in which you start creating little defects on that solid, and those defects then correlate with each other and propagate like a little liquid, right? Yes, yes. And, and, and could those those uh, helium four would be then uh, a, a solid phase of helium four plus the little defects? Would those defects could be uh, leading to a superfluid, right? Even though you are in a solid phase. Yes. Uh, so, so I mean, Newton stars, uh, presumably most of it is, is, is liquid, right? So liquid in, in the standard uh, sense, uh, maybe there's some solid crust and so on. Uh, so there, uh, the application of the standard stuff would be, you know, you had to have a solid state system and then create defects for it to, to fit the original definition. Of a so super solid. before the crust melts, basically, right? That yeah, would be the that, uh, yeah, somewhere in that region, right? I mean, it, it would, would have to be the crust and defects in the crust, right? Mm -hmm. that, that will give you that picture of, yeah. of, of, of a super solid uh, on a neutron star, the, the standard picture. Mm -hmm. If you want to include FF or LO type states, uh, you know, non-uniform superfluidity, right? Uh, as as also super solid, then uh, yeah, you have to broaden your de your definition. I mean, uh, you know, an Abrikosov lattice also have coexistence of superfluidity and a, a periodic modulation of the order parameter, if you wish. Sure. Um, and 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 those things are not usually called a super solid. Those phases. Uh, then I wanted to ask from uh, Joachim Trude that uh, do you wish some kind of new experiments that the uh, ultra gold gas uh, people should do to test your ever in <laughs> improving theories? Um, so um, I think, like uh, Alex said, this, yeah, to, to really get those coefficients themselves, that would be very hard to get that level of precision. Uh, that that one would need, um, but um, uh, I I think it would be nice to see experiments probe in more detail the the uh, thermodynamics and, and structure of these universal gases. There's been a lot of work in that direction, but I I think it would be interesting to have um, solid set of benchmarks beyond the equation of state. I think, I think slowly we're seeing, for example, progress on the side of the contact, on the side of the uh, momentum resolved structure factor. Um, because my personal view is that that is in a way 
uh, or should be the standard around which uh, nuclear physics can be built. That's my personal opinion. I know other people in nuclear physics see it differently, um, but uh, but I'd like to see a, that that systematic benchmark of all aspects of this these universal gases. So, yeah. so that's what it, I wish for. Maybe it helps that people have now more and more these uh, box traps where they they can do experiments. Do you think so? Because then you get rid of at least the trapping effect. Right, right. I think that's what Carlos said as well. Right, that that um, if you don't need to rely on the local density approximation, then uh, the deconvolution of the trap right is not needed, and you have a, a yeah. flat bottom trap, and that, that that's definitely yeah desirable for sure. Yeah, yeah. And then of course there is a lot of progress with the lattice systems with the quantum gas microscopes and so on. They can do amazing measurement, but that's not something that you could. Uh, I mean, you are not doing lattice physics, really. No, but but on the on the Monte Carlo side, I didn't mention at all, uh, or very 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 little, our Monte Carlo side. My group has historically been a quantum Monte Carlo group, really. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, with quantum Monte Carlo, that the lattice is a natural point mm. for us, for us, for, with the yeah. methods that we use, which are lattice methods. Yeah, and and by the way, I I I wanted to mention one more thing on the list of desirable things for experiments, which is the hydrodynamic response. Uh, I think that there are a couple of groups that have gone a little bit in that direction, but it would be nice yeah. to see more and and also uh, across dimensions, not yeah. just in three D. Right? I think that would be really interesting because that's that's really challenging for for us as well. So mm -hmm. so that's where the advances should be made. But that's again my personal opinion. Yes. So, so did anybody... can I ask a question to Jacobo again? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jacopo, uh, I have a question for you. You you had a slide there that you you flashed quickly, but came back forward. So so so, what's the outlook for the for those things? You have the, this, your very last slide. You flip up and back. Yes. Let me go to it. Uh, to, 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 to the, where I am. Here I am. Uh, right. And then the, you showed what, quickly what back and forth the the uh, uh, outlook uh, okay. of the. Oh, right. sorry. I think uh, so. So, what those things? What are the additional things those guys can do experimentally? Okay. No, this is. Uh, I think is. Uh, these... They're open questions. Whatever. Yeah, uh, this what, open what, question what is. I think is fine. Yeah. So, what can be done on these systems? That's a, a good question. What is the uh, the uh, the next step? So, people in circuit QED are able to create lattices with very strong uh, interactions between photons and with uh, a synthetic gauge field. This is basically done. So the big uh, concern now is to scale up to systems which are large enough for a full-fledged uh, many-body state to be hosted. So this is, uh, say, the, the, the big challenge. But this challenge is, in my opinion, a twofold. On one hand, one needs to have a system which is clean enough from disorder to be considered it as a homogeneous lattice. On the other hand, you need some ways to actually generate the many body state that you desire. Because in a, in a normal atomic fluid, you cool down the system to a low enough temperature and you know the fractional quantum hole gas is the ground state. Here you are in non-equilibrium. So uh, what is the, the stationary state of a non-equilibrium system is not at all a trivial question. But at the same time, you have the possibility of engineering the pumping and losses in a way to induce the state that you desire to be the, the stationary state. And that's another uh, big issue, big uh, challenge in this field. So once these uh, kind of uh, uh, these problems are solved, the, the big holy grail is to have uh, a, st a many body state of strong interacting photons, which display some interesting uh, quantum features. That's in my opinion, uh, uh, one of the holy grails in the next uh, few years. And I expect that both the circuit QT platform in microwaves and the, the platform with Rydberg atoms 
will soon get into at least a mesoscopic regime of, say, five uh, particles. Well, some interesting many body physics uh, can start being done. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Thank you. So, yeah. is it okay if I ask a question to Paivi about her talk? Of course. Paivi, is it okay? Discussion you... issues, yeah, yeah, why not? Okay, so, so, so yesterday you, you talked about this flat band superconductivity, and then you said that, uh, you know, you did a mean field study, but it's been compared with other techniques, and it's, uh, you know, correct. Um, do you... Uh, have a like an intuitive argument like would you expect mean field to work better for flat band than for conventional superconductivity mm. well in some special cases uh, yes uh, you, you can show that um, uh, in a type of uh, flat band, uh, like uh, you have in a leaf lattice, and when you have um, a certain type of interaction, the busiest solution is actually an exact solution. It's the same thing that is known, uh, this uh, Tasaki and Milk uh, ferromagnetism in flat band. So, so there is an ansatz that uh, uh, is exactly, it may be, maybe with the magnetism, it's easy to say that if there is a uh, no kinetic energy, the, everything wants to be magnetized in one direction immediately, and it, it's exact. So you can map that by particle hole transformation to the BCS ansatz. So in some special cases, it's even exact. This does not, however, um, extend to all possible kind of flat bands. So if I answer more generally, um, Mm. Yeah, I, I don't know, but the, the advantage of flat bands comes with small interactions. So that's why we have focused with small interactions where BCS theory is supposed to be better than with large interactions. Sure, so sure. so kind of with large interaction, it pro probably would fail, but then, then you would anyway lose the interesting flat band physics. No, I think you really answered my question, but the reason I'm asking is because, you know, in the like at, even at weak coupling for you know conventional superconductivity, uh, there's this Gorkov correction, right? So BCS theory misses that even at weak coupling. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But so it's quite different, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's okay. We have not even mm, yeah thought, thought about that. But in this uh, one one particular uh, limit where the exact solution is, then then you don't need it. Yeah, that must be suppressed or something. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, I, I think I don't have any uh, comments any... to bring up anymore. So, Carlos, okay. are we done? For so, the... so I think we are done. So good that then we end up right on time, despite the, the 13 minutes uh, lag mm -hmm. that we have from the so the little glitches. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody. So thank you very much for participating and staying all the way.